The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm the host and co-chair of the webinar. My name is Sedita Hase, and uh, I have here with me uh, Kieran Mann, my co-partner. We represent the Human Development and Leadership Division of the American Society for Quality for those who are new to our webinars, and welcome to everyone. This is a global division aiming to enrich in the personal and professional lives of our members and non-members across the global community. We host the monthly webinars, as you might have seen some of them. We continuously look for new speakers and try to add diversity to our topics as well within the range of our body of knowledge, which can be found on my ASQ, HDNL community website. Before we introduce our next guest for this month, let me go over some uh, webinar rules, just so you know, uh, and I'm pretty sure we'll get many questions on this. Uh, you do need to attend a minimum 40 minutes uh, in order to receive the 0.1 credits. So if you need those, please make sure you are staying 40 minutes minimum. We will have a 45 minutes presentation with a 15 minutes question and answers. Now, if you have questions, those questions are private. You don't see uh, the name of each other. so. Feel free to use that as you will see fit. You can use that during the webinar as well. So if I see that there is a question that really needs to be answered at that time of the presentation, we'll ask the speaker. If you feel like you want those questions or comments or experiences you have, let's try to learn from one another and feel free to use it during the webinar as well. So as this is being said, we will be recording this webinar. So you will see it in the next few days on our YouTube channel for those who are interested to go over it again. And the presentation will be shared on my ASQ uh, website for those who have uh, been there to register and know where that is. And I will be sending some links where, where you can go. But for tonight, we're very delighted and uh, I'm very excited to have um, the speaker. And um, uh, Jaroslav has been talking about this uh, topics before, but I ran into him a little bit casually. And uh, fortunately, I would say to have him accept and be here for tonight. He's a futurist speaker, trainer, and consultant, and learning designer working at the intersection between what leadership is, innovation, technology, and sustainability, especially in the fast uh, change way that we're going um, and living every day. He has about 15 years uh, of experience, a global one, having worked with clients in over 35 countries. So we get a lot of uh, diversity in experience here. Jaroslav has co-founded and managed um, RQ Genesis, which is a company, a UK-based uh, boutique consultancy firm, helping leaders uh, build future resilience and uh, create sustainable value in a very rapidly changing world. During this career, he basically has had a lot of experience and has designed and delivered more than 1,000, 10,000 of the program hours sessions, workshops, learning interventions for clients such as uh, Bayer, ASBC, uh, Shell, Accenture, so pretty, pretty uh, learned uh, experience and shared as well. He has also trained and coached thousands of entrepreneurs, uh, consultants, thought leaders, change makers globally. So we're really excited to have you here and learn from you, Jaroslav. Thank you for being here. Excellent, Sidita. Am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Excellent. Perfect. Um, well, my greetings to everybody. I cannot hear you or see you, but uh, I trust that you are well. Even, even this year has been a little bit crazy. Um, and uh, I am delighted to have been invited and to share with you some of my experiences um, around technology, innovation, uh, sustainability, and uh, leadership. Uh, Sidita has introduced me very well, so I won't spend uh, too much time here, but actually my whole career has been at the intersection of those four things, technology, innovation, leadership, and sustainability. And overall, I guess uh, the, the core value that uh, that I've been working on is helping leaders and organizations to deal with disruption uh, and, as Sarita said, uh, to create sustainable value in, in changing times. So I will cover with you um, um, kind of three topics today. The first one will be looking at uh, three major disruptions that um, are uh, both a threat, but also a huge opportunity that is ahead of us. And you can see on the slide, the first one is technology, and I'll actually zoom in more into those, but there are two others. So I'll cover that first. I'll look at these trends. And then I will look at what does this mean for industries and for organizations um, more broadly. And I will finish with looking at what does this mean for leaders uh, actually leading organizations uh, in these times that I believe are fairly unique and unprecedented in terms of uh, what we've experienced as humanity. So 
The first uh, disruption out of the three, uh, it's uh, definitely the force of technology. And uh, in some sense, technology has been a forcing function for humanity for all of its history, ever since we kind of learned how to make fire and uh, how to make tools. And um, it's been with us for a long time. However, uh, recently, uh, it's been kind of speeding up uh, and um, uh, reaching uh, you know, quite uh, interesting levels. So here, I'm sure all of you have heard about uh, the Industrial Revolution. This is determined by the World Economic Forum, and uh, we've had four Industrial Revolutions so far. First one, steam, started in the UK and spread all around the world in the 18th century and afterwards. Then we had electricity, which was the second Industrial Revolution, uh, third one, computing and information computing. We are still kind of at the tail end of that. And then the fourth Industrial Revolution, uh, which is uh, happening now and actually according to many statistics we are probably only three to five percent into uh, this fourth uh, industrial revolution uh, on this slide you can see some of the um, some of the key technologies that make up this fourth industrial revolution although it's not all of them and I'm sure you have heard about many of those so starting from the top blockchain um, biotechnology augmented virtual reality solar energy quantum computing nanotechnology self-driving cars robotics 3d printing uh, and, and AI, artificial intelligence. Um, each one of these actually uh, on their own are very disruptive, but um, uh, it's quite unprecedented. They are actually all happening uh, at the same time. So it's something that we have not dealt with before. And in some sense, we don't know where it's going to end and how it will uh, look like. And for me, the sentence in the center, it's quite key. Uh, so the world is changing faster than anyone has predicted. And this is actually a couple of uh, key reasons. The first one is that all of these technologies are based on not on linear growth but on exponential growth and it's actually the difference is uh, is quite staggering and actually our minds normally think in linear ways so uh, you know it's we can very easily imagine what it means to walk 30 meters for example if you imagine you standing up from your computer or laptop and kind of walking 30 meters you can pretty much like guess where you're going to be when you walk those 30 meters and you can also uh, quite accurately know where you're going to be one third of the way, one half of the way, and so on and so forth. So we actually think our brains think in that way because most of our history as humanity, um, Homo sapiens emerged about 200,000 years ago for the first time, it seems. Uh, so for most of our history, actually, our uh, environment and what is happening around us has been fairly linear and actually fairly local as well. It's only in the last kind of uh, uh, last century where we have become uh, global uh, and where the pace of uh, growth has has changed. So our brain are wide linearly. However, uh, the technologies that I was showing you uh, for a couple of major reasons um, uh, are actually growing exponentially. And let me just show you the difference between taking 30 linear steps and taking 30 exponential steps. So actually, if you take 30 exponential steps, um, which is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, so you're doubling uh, which is one exponential function, you're doubling every step, you actually get to a billion in 30. So, you know, compare 30 steps and a billion, and which is, by the way, almost 28 times around the planet. Um, but what I think is the most interesting in this for me is that when you actually look at the progression, uh, it's, it's very hard to know where you're going to be at the different points of the scale. So actually, for a large part of uh, the curve, it's almost like nothing is happening. Actually, when you take 15 steps, which in a linear progression is halfway, you're still only 0.003% of the 1 billion, right? So you're almost like, almost like nothing has happened. Uh, whereas in linear, you are up to 15. Here you're 0.003, right, of the billion. 20 steps, 0.09, not even 0.1%. 25 steps, only 3%. So the last five steps actually account for 97% uh, of the one, uh, 1 billion. And all of these uh, exponential technologies um, are actually driven uh, by uh, exponential progression. And there is a couple of uh, kind of uh, laws or, or rules. One of them uh, is called Moore's Law, which some of you uh, might have heard about. Uh, it's been coined by Gordon Moore, who's been one of the founders of Intel, one of the microchip companies that uh, have kind of really fueled uh, the information revolution. And basically, he's found out, I think, about in the 60s that actually the, the um, kind of performance of a microchip uh, per the same price actually doubles every uh, roughly 18 months and it's been like that uh, for the last uh, for the last 50 60 years and uh, it doesn't depend on whether there is economic boom or whether there is a depression or what's happening it doesn't depend on what's happening geopolitically it just keeps steadily progressing 
um, and um, there are kind of no signs of it slowing down. Now, the current paradigm might, uh, but there are uh, new things like quantum computing and others, uh, which means that this more slow will likely continue uh, going forward. But there is a broader law which uh, has been described by an inventor uh, named Ray Kurzweil, and he actually came up, he coins it, uh, he calls it the law of accelerating returns. And essentially, he says that the same exponential progression doesn't only apply to microchips, but it actually applies to all different other technologies. And this is because when we design a new technology, a new paradigm, something new that moves us forward, there is always, you know, we always built on the previous paradigm. So we actually accumulated technological progress, and therefore the progress is speeding up uh, and is uh, and is exponential. So um, for me, this uh, picture is kind of one of the good uh, expressions of why this is important for us right now, and also how difficult it is for human beings to think in exponential ways. So you can see here predictions of the world's top experts in electrovoltaic panels, so solar energy panels. And the colorful lines on this graph are actually their predictions at the end of every year about what's going to happen with the number of panels uh, next year, right? And you can see that they have been predict predicting kind of either a small growth or even decline in some of the years. And this is from 2006 until 2018. But the black line is actually what has really been happening. So while the number of electrovoltaic panels in the world has been growing exponentially, which is the black line, Every year for uh, you know 15 um, for almost 15 years, all of the top experts were actually predicting either uh, linear growth uh, or even a decline. So, and this is we see this in many different uh, domains because um, many people who work uh, in these fields it's harder for them because they are used to a certain way how things have always been and they um, kind of are used to the the current trends. But when they don't look into the exponential nature of technologies and the growth, it's very hard for them to predict and to kind of catch the wave. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, people who are able to spot these exponential trends, uh, they are usually able to found profitable businesses and kind of really move things uh, forward. So um, it is very hard uh, for us to see. So that's kind of one force that makes the technology uh, or makes the world change faster thanks to technology than we would think about. But the other force is actually convergence. So all of these technologies, they are exponential on their own, but because they are all happening at the same time, they are kind of coming together and speeding up the pace of growth um, even, even farther. And one example for all is um, actually flying cars. So here are some um, pictures from science fiction from the 50s and 60s. You know, we wanted to have, uh, or we were, we were thinking about flying cars for a very long time. Um, and um, the truth is that they are still not here. In fact, uh, Peter Thiel, which is one of the Silicon Valley um, uh, venture capitalists, actually a few years ago said, we wanted flying cars and instead we got 140 characters, right? So he was kind of walking in Silicon Valley and saying, why are we inventing new social networks and not actually moving forward what, you know, we kind of should have had by 2000s, right? And we don't have yet. Um, however, um, when um, uh, there is a book uh, here that I would highly recommend, which is called The Future is Faster Than You Think from Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler has been published this year. And there is one uh, interesting example here, which is a, a flying car, which finally, uh, uh, it seems are becoming possible. Actually, there has been about $1 billion invested in uh, around 25 flying car companies. And what is very interesting is that this is possible because of convergence of completely unrelated technologies. So actually, all these technologies have been developed for other use cases, other applications, but because they are all happening at the same time, they are enabling uh, a flying car. So you have something called distributed electric, electric propulsion, which means that you can have multiple rotors and means you can spread the kind of uh, lift needed to lift the flying car. Um, you have uh, artificial intelligence, you have technologies like LiDAR, which has been developed for self-driving cars mostly, which is kind of like a, um, uh, kind of like a laser scanner um, uh, that scans the environment around. Then you have GPS uh, accelerometer, which have been developed for mobile phones um, and kind of other applications. Um, obviously, those are consumer applications. A lot of these technologies were uh, developed uh, initially for um, kind of other applications, but those are consumer applications. Um, you have batteries with enough power to actually lift up the car and keep it in the air for good enough time. You have computer-aided design and simulation that can actually simulate what the aerodynamics should be and how it should work. And you have new materials and 3D printers that actually can print some of the parts. Actually, 3D printers today can print uh, aircraft engines. That's how 
uh, you know, powerful they can get the industrial uh, scale 3D printer. So those are seven technologies and many of them have been unrelated to a flying car, but because they have all developed for other applications, they have developed exponentially. When you put them together, they actually enable a uh, flying car uh, to, be, uh, to be possible. Um, so this creates quite a rapid uh, pace of change. Um, and, um, and I want to stress again that this pace of change is not necessarily related to any company or to any economy. It's, it's a general kind of broader pace of change of technology, uh, which uh, seems to be developing very, very fast, independent of other variables. In fact, Ray Kurzweil himself said that we are about to experience 20,000 years of technological progress in just 100 years in a century. So that's kind of going from hunter-gatherers, you know, when we switched to agriculture 10,000 years ago, that's kind of that until today twice uh, in, the, in the next century. So this means that uh, technology is uh, a major force and it's, it's affecting society in, in major ways. In fact, Peter Diamandis has asked himself a question, you know, how does actually technology affect uh, the world and how do industries change as this technology is progressing? What does this actually mean for businesses, for industries and for society? And it determines something called the six Ds digitized, deceptive, disruptive, demonetized, demonetized, and democratized. So essentially, when a domain becomes digital, so you move from analog to digital, and here are some examples here. You know, here's a Fitbit, here's a Tesla, which is not really a, a car, it's more like an app driving on wheels because it updates itself. Uh, you have mobile phone, I saw somewhere a very interesting statistic that basically says there is like $100,000 worth of gear inside a mobile phone, you know, from cameras to scanners to everything. Everything is somehow, concentrated and a mobile phone costs, you know, a few hundred dollars. Uh, and here you have an e-reader as well. So a lot of things from analog become digital, which means that some unique properties start to apply to this. Um, it becomes deceptive. So for some time, as we saw on the curve, nothing is happening. Um, and maybe a good metaphor here is a Chinese bamboo. So Chinese bamboo, uh, it's a specific kind of bamboo, is actually the fastest growing plant in the world. And when you plant it, for five years, there is nothing happening. You don't see anything above the ground. It's just uh, in the soil. You don't see anything. You can be watering it, but nothing happens for five years. But then it sprouts, and in five weeks, it grows 25 meters, right? So that's kind of deceptive, you know, for five years, nothing, and in five uh, weeks, 25 meters is the fastest growing plant uh, in the world. So even in nature, there are some interesting metaphors connected with exponential growth. So then uh, once this phase is over, uh, the technology becomes disruptive and disrupts different domains of society and of business. So you can see here um, uh, some, you know, books and CDs and, and videos, newspapers, a lot of these got disrupted. Now, they didn't go away completely, but what has happened in them is that uh, definitely these industries have been reshaped. And we actually see this in many different industries, um, and it's, it's kind of the demonetization. So basically, the money disappears from the old business model that uh, used to sustain uh, these older industries, and as the technology disrupts it, actually the money shifts into new businesses, into new business model. Um, a classic example that everybody knows is Kodak. Um, and when digital camera came, didn't embrace the trend powerfully enough. And essentially, uh, at the same time, when they went bankrupt, uh, Instagram, which had 13 employees, have been acquired for several billion dollars, right? So, uh, which is kind of the new technology um, uh, and looking at how to capture memories instead of how to make photographs, which, uh, which Kodak was doing. So demonetization is the fourth D. Uh, dematerialization, you can see here um, how different things in our world have been dematerialized uh, across times. And um, this uh, video starts in 1981, which is um, coincidentally when I was born, but uh, it kind of looks at how over time, um, you know, and I think you get the idea, all those things on our office desks that we used to have a device for, they have all become software, they have all become an app, they have all, um, kind of merged uh, merged in, in here. And um, it's not just kind of going to finish, but I, I think you, you get the idea. And the end of the day is going to be just the, just the computer on there, uh, on there and nothing else. So this is dematerialization out of things that previously were existing in the physical world. They are becoming, uh, they are being translated into the virtual world. Uh, and the final one is democratization. Um, actually, today, anybody with a mobile phone have access to more uh, information than uh, you know a few decades ago presidents and head of state heads of state has so technology when it spreads and it doesn't always spread and it's not that easy because it's not only a technological problem but also a political problem but when it spreads uh, it can actually um, kind of um, um, you know equalize access to information to education and to many things 
there is a promise that um, sufficiently advanced technology can actually remove even things like poverty and, and many other things uh, when we make it uh, available uh, at scale. So these are the six different Ds, and this is how the technology can impact society, can impact organizations, although, as I said, it's more complicated when you speak of society. It's just not, uh, not just technology. So this was one big trend, and I zoomed in on that because, um, because that's kind of the subject of my talk. But I could spend equal amount of time. I don't have enough time today, but I could spend equal amount of time with the two other disruptions, which are very important as well. Uh, second is sustainability, um, and uh, this is because uh, you know, our uh, progress that I have just been demonstrating uh, actually put us for the first time as humanity against the real limits uh, of the environment and of the planet that we live in. And uh, one way or another, we have to address this question about how we make our civilization its growth, its progress, and uh, how we make it sustainable uh, going forward. And I think um, this kind of intersection between the rapid growth of technology and our world, I mean, we have quadrupled the amount of population on this planet uh, in the last 100 years, which is quite staggering when you, when you think of it. Um, and so how that kind of rapid growth, how that can be sustained and how can it exist within some of the real boundaries that actually our planet uh, and the kind of life support ecosystems that we depend on uh, oppose to us. And um, I don't think we have figured that out. And I think it's going to be a big topic, not only for this decade, but for, uh, for the rest of the century. And I think we have become acutely aware of some of these things in the last uh, few months. And the final disruption or opportunity is society, actually, as, as humanity is becoming more and more connected, there are quite some radical changes in how we think of ourselves, how we communicate, uh, how we think of our lives, um, how we think of each other. Um, and there are many new societal trends, some of them positive, some of them not so positive. And uh, those are also accelerating and we'll have to address them. So these three topics uh, are quite key uh, for this decade and for, uh, for the rest of the century. So hopefully this gives you a good context of uh, where we find ourselves today. I'm sure you knew many of these things, but I just thought it's helpful to, to place it at the beginning of our, of our talk. So for all these reasons, I think it's quite safe to say that our future will not just be a mere extension of the past but it actually um, will be fairly different because of all of the trends that I have discussed. So it's not like 10 years from now, we'll just be 10%, you know, um, kind of uh, farther along the journey, but there are quite some radical changes potentially ahead of us uh, on the horizon. Actually, when you think of the linear growth, um, it's, it's actually interesting when you think of change. And change is difficult. We kind of, as human beings, we like things to be as they were yesterday, tomorrow. Uh, we like things to be constant. But when uh, the pace of change is linear, actually for most people and most organizations, the cost of not changing is, um, is kind of lower than cost of changing. This is why it's difficult to change things and to make things different. But actually, as pace of change speeds up and it's become exponential in more and more parts of our society, the cost of not changing becomes higher than cost of changing. Uh, and I think this is maybe one of the key points of, of my talk, that as we lead organizations, as we think of our businesses, as we think of what we do, we need to realize that actually not doing anything, not changing, actually it's becoming more costly than changing. Uh, and therefore, uh, it is important for us uh, to really be interested where the future is going and what it can mean for us, for our industry, for our organizations, for our leadership, and for, for our teams. But more importantly, I think uh, all of this gives a huge opportunity to actually reimagine the future. We actually really have in our hands some uh, very uh, interesting decisions, important decisions, and also interesting uh, kind of tools that we can maybe for the first time in human history really imagine how do we want the world to be, how do we want our organizations to be, and how do we want to make things happen. And I think this is a huge opportunity that we have ahead of us, um, and I think it's starting to touch on the topic of leadership because I believe that the role of leaders today uh, is to take an active role in shaping that future, taking into account those trends that I was, uh, that I was describing. And now let's zoom in very quickly, briefly on organizations, because most of you, I assume, work in organizations. And actually, it's not technology that changes the world. Um, it's not about on all these trends alone, but it's actually how technology gets commercialized and how it gets brought to the world. This is one change that um, you know, has been a while ago. Uh, this is uh, Fifth Avenue in the 1900s and Fifth Avenue in 1913, 13 years later. 
maybe you have seen uh, already this uh, picture, but on the left, you basically have one automobile, one car, and everything else is horses. And on the right, you can see all cars, although somebody mentioned there is a horse somewhere there, but I don't, I don't, I don't see, but maybe there is, there is at least one. But the bottom line is that in 13 years, uh, things have radically shifted. But they have not shifted because of automobile, because automobile has been um, kind of patented in the uh, late 19th century and has been around for you know a few decades before this change have happened. But it's been changed because of um, um, primarily because of Henry Ford and his business innovation. Uh, he actually, uh, if any of you have read the Blue Ocean Strategy book, he actually has taken um, the price of horse carriage and determined the price of a car that uh, he needed to compete with the horse carriage for it to actually not be economical for people to own horse carriage anymore and actually all buy cars. Then he deducted from that his margin and then he came up with a production cost which was at the time impossible to produce. So therefore he needed to create an innovation which was the assembly line, you know, you can have any color as long as it's black, standardized production and, and all that kind of thing. Um, and that allowed him to produce the cars at a price that was actually directly competing with the horse carriages then as a result uh, you know, uh, the the horses have been very, very quickly out of business, which I'm sure they didn't mind, but, um, and it all shifted to the cars very quickly. So it is actually technology and its successful commercialization and spread within the society that actually changes the world or kind of changes the future. And I think this is important for us to, uh, to realize. Uh, here are a few books that are looking at what kind of business models today, so 100 years later or, or more, uh, 115 years later or more, um, uh, what kind of business models and what kind of organizations today are actually um, able to take these new technologies and benefit from them and implement them. So here are just a few books. Um, uh, Sarita said you'll have the slides later so you can kind of look at that. But I have been personally uh, working with Salim Ismail, who's the author of a book, Exponential Organizations. And Salim actually six years ago, he uh, looked at some of the most iconic, fastest growing organizations that actually already are tapping into the key technological trends that I was presenting. And actually, his central research question was, can organizations, can our organizations scale as fast as technology can? So if technology is giving us all these opportunities, can we also scale our organizations not to slow it down, right? Because if we have these opportunities, but our organizations are not embracing them, we are not inventing new use cases, new, new customer applications of these technologies through our businesses, then the progress that we can have will never happen right? um, because it won't. So uh, he looked at about 200 of some of the most innovative, fastest growing iconic organizations. Some of them you can see here on the slide and some of them are kind of like traditional players that embrace very well uh, exponential technologies and innovation. And some of them uh, are completely new players that actually haven't existed, you know, 10, 15 years, years ago. They just emerged thanks to uh, modern technology. And Salim has been with the team able to identify 11 different characteristics that help these organizations to scale exponentially. And uh, in short, it's a massive transformative purpose, which is at the core, uh, which always speaks about how the company uh, how the world will look different if the company succeeds. So you can think of organize the world information from Google or ideas for spreading from TED and kind of many others. And then you have five externally facing attributes, uh, which are the acronym there is SCALE. So staff on demand, community and crowd algorithms, leverage assets and engagement. And five internal attributes, which help you to manage the organization as it grows exponentially which is um, interfaces, dashboards, experimentation, autonomy, and social technologies. Um, I won't go more into that, uh, but I recommend to book exponential organizations um, or kind of looking into the many videos and talks that are around this uh, topic online. But essentially, uh, when organizations are able to embrace these attributes, we are seeing they are able to invent new business models uh, and they are able to uh, scale faster than their peers and therefore benefit more from the technologies and from the trends that I was outlining. Um, I am a member of a global community. We have over 6,000 people who are working in innovation. And those are some companies that have implemented uh, some of the attributes um, that, uh, that you have seen or work with it uh, and kind of benefited uh, from it. But what I think is interesting is, and now we're shifting to the final part of the talk, which is around leadership, is actually um, when we look at, uh, you know, we have the technological trends, we have the organizational trends and, and kind of the new models for organizations. But we also are looking at what does this mean for leaders leading existing organizations, right? Because obviously, we have an existing, you know, our economy is based on 
uh, the, the kind of uh, current way of doing things and now, now this new is coming and it's interesting uh, this research has been made by uh, MIT uh, Sloan School uh, at the beginning of this year uh, and in essence uh, maybe it's too small some of the things to see but in essence they find out that only one out of ten organizations feel they already have leaders with the skills to navigate this new world uh, again about one out of ten uh, feel that the leaders have the right mindset to uh, embrace um, kind of the digital wave that is coming and uh, and only one third one one tenth uh, have uh, kind of said they feel they are confident to compete uh, in this new world uh, that we are going into so a huge gap in terms of being ready for what is coming and just remember the digitize is only step one of the six step process that I was presenting before right and a couple of interesting quotes here uh, actually it, uh, kind of speaks that uh, it's not about developing new skills for leaders, but actually it's to developing new mindset or a new way of operating. And also that uh, leaders are realizing that for them to be able to transform their companies, they need to transform themselves and their teams. So I think it's a very telling piece of research. Uh, I'm sure uh, it's about four and a half thousand leaders, 120 countries. And actually those are two uh, surveys from last year. Um, one of them is Europe specific, but 40% um, of EU company employees are certain the companies will not will disappear in the next 10 years. If they don't radically change themselves. So that's almost half. And then on the right side, you have another research from uh, late last year, which basically says the top uh, 10 concerns or top seven concerns of CEOs. And you can see here besides attracting top talent, which is kind of a normal one that's uh, always been there for the last few years and cost reduction, which is number five, you can see three new trends that don't normally feature on these surveys. Create new business models because of disruptive technologies, create a more innovative culture and develop next generation leadership, right? So it's very interesting for me that these three trends, they actually made it to top five. And this is what CEOs are thinking. So clearly all of these things that I've been describing, they are around and they are impacting, um, impacting leadership. So let's spend a little bit of time on leadership and then I'll hand over to you for, uh, for some questions. But essentially it's important first to define leadership and uh, there are many definitions out there and this is not like the truth definition or the perfect definition, this is the definition I am using. So I just thought before I tell you about leadership, I thought it fair to tell you what I mean um, by leadership. So for me, leaders also taking into account everything I have described so far, um, leaders, not, leaders are not just in business, but they are in all domains of society. And essential leadership means to improve the status quo and serve as a role model for their behavior. So it's about kind of what you create, the outcomes, uh, right? But it's also, about the character of the leader and how they go about creating those outcomes. So this has this is kind of my working definition uh, of leadership that I've been using for my research and work with leaders. And this is what I'll be presenting um, presenting today. So essentially, and I'm sure this is not the first iceberg you have uh, ever seen, but uh, essentially, the, you know, when you take a leader, um, you have certain outcomes that they create in the world. But to create these outcomes, they take certain actions, they make decisions, and also they develop uh, certain skills that they use and deploy to make these outcomes. Uh, but also, uh, that's kind of the visible things that we can all see, but also there are some invisible things, things like their thoughts, their mindset, emotions, beliefs, principles, values. And kind of to simplify that, I would call everything below uh, the waterline the operating system uh, of leaders and everything above the line um, is uh, kind of the application. So if you think of your mobile phone and um, those are icons from from iphone but you can take your favorite um you can take android or any other operating system but essentially you have like the invisible operating system that is running your phone and you don't you don't know about it much uh, you update it every you know once a year or something like that but you don't know about it much but then you have the apps that you interact with you can download new ones when you need a new thing you just download a new app and you use it and it's the same uh, with leadership we have this underlying operating system that runs our leadership and that influences our leadership actions. And then on top of that uh, operating system, we install the apps, right? So we have how we deal with um, our team, how we motivate them. We have how we communicate our ideas. We have uh, some business skills, all of these things we are plugging into the mindset. But actually the key underlying function here, just like in the iceberg, because you have the currents of the wind on the top and then you have the currents of the water and clearly the currents of the water determine where the iceberg goes right so in the same way actually it is the leadership operating system that we have that actually determines um, our effectiveness and our outcomes that we create uh, the applications can be relatively easily upgraded or 
kind of uh, refreshed um, or you know one become obsolete you install a new one but if the operating system is not supportive to the exponential change we were discussing and to the kind of things we were speaking about uh, the outcomes uh, are not uh, the ones you can have therefore uh, the conclusion here is the faster the world around us changes the less meaningful according you know in my opinion of course um, um, you know it's just my opinion but uh, and in my research what I have found is that uh, the more the world around us is changing, the less it matters what skills you have and the more it have matters what mindset you have because lifelong learning is now kind of becoming a norm. So the idea that you study something and then you just apply it for the rest of your life, I'm very sure that you're very familiar with it, you know that doesn't exist. But for you to be able to pick the right skills, to be able to envision the right opportunities, to be able to see the new jobs that will be created that you can take, to be able to create new businesses, for all of this, you need the right operating systems. It's not the apps. The apps are plugging into your operating system. But for you as leaders to navigate a better future and for the leaders that you serve in your organizations, what is very important is that they have the right operating system uh, onto which they can fairly easily plug in, um, plug in the apps. So this leads me to um, the final part that I wanted to cover with you today, which is uh, I've been researching and asking myself, just like Stalin was asking, you know, can organizations scale as fast as technology can? I have been asking, what is the right operating system for leaders leading today to help them navigate the time ahead and to fulfill some of the promises that I was mentioning? So, you know, part of it is reactive for organizations to, to make it and to survive and to adapt. But part of it, as I said, I think is aspirational, which is we now have maybe for the first time ability to really create uh, the future of our organizations um, and uh, the future of our world. So the operating system um, um, has six different dimensions. Uh, you can think of it as like six different buckets of, of um, kind of ways of thinking and I'll go through them in detail, but essentially it's at the core is uh, one's purpose, which becomes like a driving force that actually helps you and helps the leader to choose what things to work on, what things not to work on and what things to do. So this is the aspiration, uh, how to move things forward. Why I do what I do is the central question here. Uh, then is the leader's mindset, so how they make sense of the world around them. And you know, one element of it is if we see linear progression everywhere, we will take different decisions and actions than if we see the exponential reality of what's happening. Uh, and the uh, third one is empathy, uh, which is looking at how we deal with our own emotions, but also with emotions of others. How do we inspire, motivate, and lead other people's people, build trust. Uh, ethics, which is how we decide between the right and wrong. Uh, and uh, this is a definitely a very loaded uh, question because it's not always easy to determine that. And I think uh, there is a lot of discussions about a lot of topics these days trying to determine what is right or wrong. But I think it's very important to have it as an explicit part of the operating system, which is to uh, reflect on ethics. And for me, what's interesting about ethics is not only about what we aspire to do, but what we do at the end, right? So um, I have heard an interesting quote. Somebody said that uh, it's nice to know what you aspire to do, but uh, show me your schedule and your bank account and I can tell you what you really are doing. Um, and I think this is for me what, uh, what kind of ethics and broader sense um, are about. Um, vitality, which is how do we maintain ourselves, our energy, our health. Uh, we know very acutely in the last few months that when health goes away, you know, no leadership really is possible. So this is maybe something that is not always included in, in kind of leadership alongside ethics, but I find it very important to include because this gives us the strength and the resilience to actually navigate the disruptions and changes around us. And the final one is flow or in broader sense, our own inner state. So what is actually happening inside of, inside of us and are we performing at our best? Because all these other things can be in place, but when we are in front of that important meeting or in front of important conversation or representation, when we don't put ourselves in the right state, a lot of this can go, uh, can go in vain. I will spend just a minute on each one of those. And uh, as Sirita said, you'll have these slides, so um, uh, you can come back to this later. But purpose is essentially your own unique answer to the question, why am I here? Why do I exist? Why I do what I do? Um, you can apply different levels of philosophicalness to that, um, but uh, uh, that's, that's what it's answering, the question why. Uh, and some key attributes of powerful purpose statements of people that I have worked with or that I have come across with. Uh, powerful purposes are not about you, they are about the world, how you want the world to be different. They are more outward oriented. They are future oriented as well, so they are imagining the world differently into the future. Uh, they make things better, they are generative. 
uh, it's not something you can achieve in a couple of years. So it's not like a goal for the next two years. It's actually something you can work on for a long time. It's broad enough to uh, you know, accommodate any career pivots and actually any jobs. So like being a doctor, for example, is not, not necessarily a purpose statement. Maybe helping people or healing people might be. And then, then actually that can accommodate all kind of different career pivots and roles that you can take. You can be a doctor, you can be in a hospital, you know, you can do all kinds of things. You can train about health and wellness and all of that can be helping that, uh, that purpose. It fills you with energy and inspiration, uh, inspires other people as well. So it's not only inspiring for you, but inspiring for others. And it's usually short and crisp. It's usually kind of a, you know, something you can communicate very, very easily, maybe three, four, five words or something like this. A framework I have been using, and I'll just put it here and you can, uh, you can do the exercise later, but it's basically look at, this is actually inspired by the Japanese concept of Ikigai. Some of you might have come across it, which looks at how to live a life worth living. And essentially, um, you know, you answer first the four question on the outside. So what are you passionate about? What you're good at, like probably good at across uh, your career, what can you get paid for or rewarded for, and what does the world need from you? And then you're, you're looking in the center of that and determining that kind of one sentence statement. So you're asking, you know, my purpose is dot, 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 and you're filling it in. Uh, so this is an exercise that you can, you can take on later. So as you see, this is in the center and this determine kind of the core of the other dimensions. And this helps leaders in exponential time to actually navigate the disruption and the changes around them and to actually take an active role in shaping the future and making it different. Mindset determines how leaders make sense of the world and some of the key elements, growth mindset, uh, I'm sure many of you know the world of Carol Dweck, the fixed and growth mindset, uh, and then things like curiosity, creativity, uh, versatility, being able to do multiple things, uh, although it seems to be that uh, for a long time it was very good to specialize. Actually, um, I, I think it's almost like uh, in, in developer land in, when you look at IT professionals, you have something, there's a world called full stack developer, which means that they can do multiple things. They can do front end, which is how the things look like, back end, which is the code itself and other things. And it seems that many successful leaders that are really able to shape things, they are able to do multiple things and they are bringing quite unusual connections across the career. It's not just they specialize in one thing, but they are able to actually bring many different things together. And ambidexterity, they are able to think of the current organization, but also on what the organization will become in the future. Um, actually, one of the books that I was on the list was called Lead and Disrupt, and they have researched about 200 companies and looking at why some of them have been able to change over the last 100 years and why some of them have gone bankrupt. And they determined it was the mindset of the leaders and they were citing ambidexterity, being able to focus on succeeding of the success of the current business, at the same time creating new future businesses that actually sustain the business as the environment and the industry around them uh, changes. Some key recommendations for leaders wanting to develop the right mindset for exponential times, become a futurist, uh, have a point of view about the future, become interested in the future, uh, invest in continuous learning and learning new things, be very curious, uh, find spaces to reflect on past and the future, um, kind of on your, on your own and looking at the past of your own life, your decisions, but also looking at setting goals and looking forward. Create space for solitude. Uh, it's harder and harder because even, you know, we are actually exposed to flow of information to other people's thoughts all the time. Even music is somebody else's thoughts that they have put into a recording. So spaces of solitude, especially at least for me, nature is a very powerful place, is very, very important. When we don't actually have anything coming in, we can just be with our own thoughts. And choose who you learn from and spend time with. Um, I have heard recently that you know, uh, one of my favorite quotes is that you are the average of the 10 people that you spend the most time with. So these are the things around the mindset, uh, empathy, about to feel, understand and inspire others and the world more broadly. And the key elements here are trust, courage, inspiration, and that emotional resilience, right? Being able to be resilient. And key recommendations, um, be genuinely interested in who are other people and what they care about, especially if you're working with a lot of other people, one of the best ways to build a lot of relationships and trust is to just care about who people are and what makes them tick and how they work. Um, take time to understand what they care about, recognize and understand your own emotions and your own emotional triggers and that kind of uh, trigger you. Uh, be genuine in your interactions and practice generative communication, meaning communication where you actually create new opportunities and possibilities in meetings. Instead of shutting things down, you're actually creating new things. Um, ethics, ability to make the right leadership decisions to create the best possible outcomes. Some key elements here are your values, principles, decisions, and integrity, 
which is a match between what you say and aspire to do and what you actually do at the end. Not as easy as it sounds. Uh, it's actually probably one of the hardest things to be able to bring it to life. And then in terms of key recommendations to be able to apply ethics, create time and space for key decisions. Sometimes we are very rushed into key decisions and we make wrong decisions as a result. Consider key aspects of the decisions at hand, such as things like what does the law say, what does my values and principles say, and what will be the impact on everybody involved in those decisions. Uh, study ethics. There is a lot of uh, ethics in philosophy, but also in different religious traditions, and there is a lot of ethical wisdom. Actually, has not changed so much. And even though our civilization got much more complex and bigger and technological, ethics, uh, um, you know, have been quite, of quite steady and our ability to aspire and, and live those ethics um, uh, has not become easier for sure. Um, review your decisions over time and be honest uh, with yourself about where you succeeded and where you did not. Vitality, it's your ability to generate and sustain the needed health and energy to support your leadership. Key elements, no surprise here, what you eat, how you rest and how you exercise and kind of move your, your body. And key recommendations, uh, there are some great practices in both Western and Eastern medicine and kind of uh, approaches to living a healthy life. Uh, it's very important to be intentional about what you eat um, because what we eat is kind of the fuel of everything else. Our bodies change um, um, kind of uh, some parts of our bodies, you know, change uh, very, very rapidly. Um, I don't know the numbers, but I think it's like every six weeks, all the water is different and every few months, our skin is completely changed. It's regenerated from what we eat, right? So clearly what we eat is very important. Rest when you need um, and find a time to rest and get adequate sleep, choose regular exercise. And discipline is something that is very important for vitality, which is sticking to the habits and kind of building your own confidence and ability to, to stick to things, things over time. And the final element here uh, is uh, flow. Uh, these are some uh, some flow triggers. They are actually coming from the world of flow research collective. Stephen Kotler has been researching this state scientifically for the past decade or so, uh, but essentially he's determined, uh, I think it's about 14 different triggers, environmental, psychological, social, and creative. But more broadly, this actually speaks about what state are you in? Because as I said before, it really determines the outcomes you can create. So manage your attention and focus. It's very easily to get disrupted and actually I think when you're in flow, you're like 500% more effective than when you're not. So just think about, you know, what is the price of working on something, being in flow, and just somebody sends you a WhatsApp message and you open that and get disrupted, dis distracted for one minute. And it takes 15 minutes to go back to where you were, right? So just think of what is the, what is the opportunity cost of that. Um, be aware of positive, but also negative triggers. Uh, know yourself and what actually triggers you, but also what creates a sense of flow for you. Uh, practice how to create a flow when you need. Um, I use music, but there can be other method methods for that. Create the right physical environment for your work. Uh, and as I said, um, uh, music is one that works for me. It usually needs to be music without vocals, just um, kind of instrumental music. So this is in short, the operating system for Exponential Times. I'm happy to answer any question, uh, questions about that. And um, I actually don't, don't have time for this because I need to, uh, need to wrap up, but um, I want to finish with a, a quote. And the quote is from the book, Features Faster Than You Think. And I think it's, it's very interesting because it describes what is ahead of us. Um, there is little doubt that the decades to come will be filled with radical breakthroughs and world-changing surprises. Every major industry uh, on, our planet and, uh, on our planet is about to be completely reimagined. For entrepreneurs, for innovators, for leaders, for anyone sufficiently nimble and adventurous, the opportunities will be incredible. There will be both a future that's faster than you think and arguably the greatest display of imagination rendered visible that the world has yet uh, seen. So on that note, uh, it's clear that the role of leadership uh, is more important than ever. There are huge opportunities, but also some dangers and things for us to figure out. And I just put here some links and happy to connect with anybody uh, on LinkedIn if you're interested in these topics further. So I will stop now. Um, thank you for your attention. I appreciate your time today. And um, that's my timer here. And I'm just- so uh, organized. Sit it go for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jaroslav. Um, I kind of um, let you talk because I, I really enjoy this topic and um, I like the approach you take on it. Um, as you were starting this, uh, webinar we spoke about leadership and we we're like well, so when are we talking about leadership but then setting up the the pace and and seeing the facts of seeing companies and organizations as we had some time to explore this topic together before 
it is important mm -hmm. to see that companies are doing it because you know it's a, a survival yeah. or either you change or you just uh, stay back so we have to go with it so i'd like um to hear some thoughts from the audience if they have any questions or um something that's challenging for them when it comes to rapid change and just from a pro professional standpoint as you mentioned your goal was also at the personal level so it'll be yeah. interesting to to see if they have any challenges they would like to discuss with you um in the meantime so please use the question box and um the future is now i see some comments thank you for taking us on the future we're actually a little bit uh, in the past because we should have been a bit faster in uh, when it comes to people change, it's a bit slower as a path. Um, as we wait for questions, I would like you actually to share the slide you had on um, on the operating system, either that one. I also enjoyed the mindset one because I feel like it does start with uh, mindset, which also starts from beliefs and values. One of those uh, would be good and might, you might explore. This one? Um, let me see because I have the questions in front of me. Uh, yeah, I do enjoy this a lot. I feel like many people just stop at the very surface of it. So I have a question as we let mm -hmm. uh, the audience uh, think through this and see what it triggers to them. One of the questions we have here is, uh, what business masters would you recommend to manage the future changes coming? I'm not sure. Business masters, you mean like educational, educational. programs? Um, so, Alberta, I'm reading your question, education. We always look mm -hmm. for education, we just go hiking somewhere by myself and reflect on myself first. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> what's your thought on this, uh, Jaroslav? I feel like we expect from education everything and it does start. Well, I think, I think it's... Um... I think it's a great question. I mean, um, I um, I think a lot of um, kind of traditional um, in business schools, I have seen them embracing a lot of these trends and actually reforming their programs. But the reality is that many of them have been created more to serve people in larger organizations. For example, there is not many programs today that actually teach you how to build, you know, something yeah. like Airbnb or, or something like that. So um, I think, um, you know, depending on what you're looking, if you're looking to lead in a large organization, um, I would uh, probably um, look whether some of the trends that I was presenting here, whether they are included in the program that you are uh, you are considering. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some interesting trends. For example, Ernst & Young, uh, this year, I think it was Ernst & Young, mm -hmm. they made an MBA available for every single one of their employees globally. Um, IBM did that an, too, I think, in Germany. I saw that. Quite interesting from an organization. However, I am kind of a little bit more, I mean, that's kind of the, the you know, the, the path that many people take. My mm -hmm. path has always been a little bit more self-education, so just being very curious, reading books, and also putting myself into places and experiences where I could learn these things, actually doing them. Because one thing is to learn the theory, and the other one is to do it. So, you know, I was interested to be, you know, learn about entrepreneurship, so I joined a startup, right? Or mm -hmm. I was interested to um, kind of work on leadership, so I became a leader myself, right? And so these kind of uh, these kind of things, I think, are quite key. Uh, there are also now different new programs that are emerging, especially now uh, with everything becoming digital. Um, so there is a program I think called the Power MBA, which is um, kind of the idea is like 15 minutes a day for a year. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it's kind of a different way to learn. It's all virtual and the price is, you know, well, more than 10 times less than you would spend for a, yeah. for a, for a normal MBA. So I would probably look at like innovative courses, innovative programs, but I think there is actually no substitute for self-study, almost like creating your own MBA, you know, um, yes. so maybe with some mentor or some guidance, but that's what I would recommend. I, I do agree. I've gone through both MBA and both leadership studies, and I only learned how mm -hmm. valuable the leadership was when I started working. So I feel like uh, we need to touch hands um, the experience that we're looking for and what's challenging us, but it always comes with awareness. How much aware are we? So I do think that we need some uh, self-reflection first to see what we really need and maybe mm -hmm. ask the people around us who might see what we don't see and go deeper as you have in this uh, slide here. One of the questions here mm -hmm. is actually talking about that as well. It's saying, um, while I often see belief and values drive the direction of our life, where our life takes us, basically, uh, can you share your thoughts on how emotion can be a guide uh, for us? And uh, well, again, I can't keep not 
giving my opinion here. So I feel like it does start with <laughs> beliefs and values, and then that turns into the emotion and then goes into the action. But uh, what would you, mm. what would you say? I think, I think emotions are, you know, kind of um, really complex and actually somehow difficult for many people to work with. Also, you know, our working environments are often not very embracing towards different emotions. And it's almost something that we like leave on the door when we clock in, you know, when we walk into the office. But um, I think that, um, Emotions are a very powerful source of information, um, I would say. And I think mm -hmm. understanding um, even our emotional states, like, you know, some people, when you ask them uh, how you feel, they might not have that many distinctions, but actually looking and knowing, like, what is the feeling? Is it is it anger? Is it frustration? Is mm -hmm. it disappointment? Like actually understanding my own emotions and how, how I feel. And then actually asking why I feel that way. Uh, is, it, is it because, you know, something has happened? Is it because of something in me? Or is it actually, an important source of information. Is it telling me something that I cannot access with my rational mind, right? And I think the more you understand your emotions, the more you can use emotions to, to guide your decisions and to complement some of the more rational things, right? And then you get into things like intuition and mm -hmm. things like that. I think some of the most powerful decisions is when you actually combine what your mind tells you with what your heart tells you and with what your intuition tells you. But that actually takes a certain amount of mastery and understanding of your own emotions. It's not something you can do from day one. The day one thing is just to actually even know yourself and what kind of emotions you have, and then being able to tap into it as a source of information, I think can be uh, can be very powerful. And I uh, absolutely agree on this one. It's um, And we do have a community here, which is quality professionals. So we're basically certified in quality. We should know, and we have the tools, so we should use them for ourselves as well. We have five whys, which mm -hmm. you keep asking and digging deeper. So why this and then... Uh, a causes B and B is because of C and things like that. So you go to, you go to the root cause, you have mind mapping. So you kind of see a perspective mm -hmm. of how things are interconnected and, and see the, the settings of where you are and whatever you're thinking about. Um, we don't have time, but I do want to go with the last question because, uh, mm -hmm. as I said, it's these topics are kind of easy to, to hear, but they do need some time to reflect on. So that's why I'm taking a lot of time and putting the slide on it to see what uh, it triggers to people. So one of the questions was about this um, six attributes you have about leadership for exponential mm -hmm. times. Uh, would you consider um, some sort of uh, iteration or a comprehensive mode? How do you think that uh, we can implement that? Um, you mean if I would consider like... Is there any order to it? Any, no, I would you uh, order, order, order to it or would just like mm -hmm. overall, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, what an excellent question. Well, I think um, I think that the purpose is key, but to define the purpose, um, you know, you need to look at um, look at the mindset. Like, it's very hard uh, to envision um, yourself in the future or envision your own purpose uh, mm -hmm. if your perception of what's happening around you is not accurate, right? So, yep. for example, if you don't know that the world is growing exponentially, you might envision yourself linearly, and then uh, you know everything might change around you. So. I think um, I think the kind of mindset is very key, and I think the values, beliefs, which is kind of included in the ethics, uh, are very key as well. So I would probably start with that triangle, um, and allow that to actually kind of set the direction. And then the other three uh, is something that I think can help you on the journey itself. Um, so the way you understand your own emotions, the way you inspire, build trust, you bring alongside a people alongside with you the way you maintain your energy and health and the way you manage your state so i would probably say if i were to pick a sequence i would start with the upper three and then a set of direction and then i would use the lower three to do kind of like the how so maybe the one is like the what and the mm -hmm. bottom three are like the how so we have some homework to do thanks jerusalem for um giving us some homework i think uh, as i said before it does take some time to reflect on these topics so we will be sharing as i said the uh, presentation so we will have a lot of time to to reflect and uh, if they have questions i'm sure you'd uh, enjoy some connection and uh, provide some feedback so we can do that in the context that you have there so thank you jerislav uh, much appreciated as i said it was random but uh, sometimes the most random thing are the ones that click there. <laughs>
So it's good to talk about mm -hmm. here. Thank you so much. Thank for you very much. I really appreciate the invitation and thank you everybody for your attention. I can see 82 people. It's a little bit disembodied, but um, yeah. <laughs> I hope you are all well and, uh, and happy to connect with anybody around these topics. So thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. So the presentation will be on our uh, YouTube channel and my ASQ. We do have um, a survey, which is a one minute thing that we use to get feedback on how, how you felt about it. You have some open space this uh, time as well to enter what you what your thoughts were. And um, uh, please do that. We take that into account and change as we go. So we're trying to change with the flow. Um, on top of that, we do have uh, the email I'll be sending it to you, as I said, for the 40 minutes minimum, uh, whoever attended will be having the CEO uh, email from me as a separate email. And uh, our next webinar actually is going to be on what we're going through right now. So we are working and we're working remotely. So we'll have a speech on October 7 um, with uh, Luciana Paulis and she talks about um, leading remote teams. And she's an expert and has written a book as well on 5S. So pretty connected to where we're going right now. So thank you so much for being here and we'll talk to you next month. Thank you.